Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ventures Podcast. This conversation is all about self-sovereign identity, sovereignty of data control, and just the whole broad conversation of identity in general. There are a ton of questions that we dive into this, and I'm excited to be able to share it with you. My guests today are Solomon Cates and David Harding, and they are longtime experts in cybersecurity, and an identity. David has a whole portfolio of intellectual property he's developed in this space. And we get into the nuances, both from a perspective of a venture builder investor, how to think about identity and onboarding and both uh, creating the identity and matching that to a human being and the continual authentication of that identity. And obviously it's a different conversation, whether you're just doing a relatively trivial app that you don't necessarily care that one identity is tied to a human. Or obviously if you're a government, TSA, you need high, you know, a bank, centralized exchange, you need a high amount of security. There are different levels of identity verification and identity fidelity that are required. So this is extremely nuanced conversation. I'm glad to have an episode entirely devoted to it. So if you are watching, you can also listen anywhere that you get your podcasts. You can just search for ventures and it should show up. And if you're listening, you can also visit wclittle.com and you can watch it. And there you'll see more extensive show notes to uh, the things that we talk about today. So with that, please enjoy this episode with David Harding and Solomon Cates. All right, Solomon, David, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Good to be back. So we have had a number of conversations recently about self-sovereign identity, sovereignty in general, from nation states down to individuals, communities, everything in between. And we've also had a series of conversations around identity. I've always been thinking about identity and self-sovereign identity in Web3 from the perspective of, hey, I'd love my identity and, and my data to be on blockchains. But it wasn't until some recent conversations that I realized that is just extremely small dimension of the overall universe of the conversation around identity and data sovereignty. So the two of you have such an amazing background and wealth of experience in this conversation that I'm delighted that you're able to carve out some time here. So can we start? Saul, Solomon, would you mind just going first? Tell us sure, a bit about yeah. your background. Yeah, happy to. So I've been here before. I think it's been about a year since the last time I did a recording with you. So it's good to be back in the saddle. Welcome back. Um, thank you. Uh, so just brief history, 28 plus years of cyber, IT, technology. Uh, I was blessed to be really bad at school. So I found a way to learn from masters <laughs> and uh, really got that, that, that the honor of working with some really, really brilliant people that taught me their ways. So from cyber to building systems to learning how to defend systems. Um, I really, really like, you know, the, the, the concept of cybersecurity as a topic, but I've always loved defense. How do you build a system that no one can break? Or how do you build games that are positive to make sure that everybody wins? So every day I get to wear a different hat, but uh, for the most part, I, I really thrive in, as, as a CTO and a technologist at Talos where I've been building these types of systems for years for governments, for enterprises, and hopefully for humanity as well. So it's a bit about me. And uh, I do love conversations like I've had with David over the last five, six months, understanding what's really under the hood when it comes to identity, because uh, I think quite a few people just take it for granted. So I'm looking forward to this as well. David? Thanks again for having me. Um, This is first time on. This is my first time on this podcast. Um, My background started in software engineering, kind of like Solomon. I went to the school of hard knocks and uh, (laughs) got uh, had the wonderful opportunity to work with some really great people and be mentored and learn how to be a good engineer, a solid engineer. And uh, then in my mid twenties, went the executive route, public companies. So I found myself as an SVP of a public company. From there, I primarily held chief technology officer, SVP, EVP positions in public companies. The past uh, 18 years of that has been in digital identity biometrics, mostly in government space, airport security, border control, voting systems, a lot of law enforcement. But for the past uh, few years, it's really been around cybersecurity um, and uh, consumer use of digital identity. So I uh, 
I am a privacy wonk. I really am uh, someone who believes very strongly in that we should uh, be protecting our privacy. And I'm looking forward to having this discussion today. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I know the two of you can talk uh, at a very expert level on both uh, sovereignty at, at, across the spectrum that we've been talking about around identity, all the different nuances of, of identity. Um, so maybe Solomon, if you wouldn't mind, could you just educate the, the audience, the investors, entrepreneurs, and others listening in um, about this the concept of data sovereignty, why that's important, sovereign identity, and then we'll hand it off to David for uh, maybe more of a, a fundamental education about the different aspects of identity in particular. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, for those that don't realize this, it's been a struggle for most of humanity to maintain their sovereignty. You know, the way that we've built governments, the way that corporations and capitalism work, every country has their own version of the same challenge, which is agency and sovereignty of the human, and then creating communities of sovereign people you know, these, these building of a collective interest that have their ability to be sovereign unto their own, their own agency, somebody can't take it away. So when you, you think about just sort of the digital landscape we live in, and what used to be our documents and our stories that we would carry from generation to generation, it's now become information that's all over the place. And, you know, the, the challenge has been you don't necessarily have ownership of that information once it leaves your little circle, right? Your home, your device, they all start to now pick up information about you and share it with the interested parties out there. And that's not necessarily sovereignty. So when you're trying to get digital or data sovereignty, you need a way, a mechanism to actually assert who you are tie your information to that identity, you know, that, 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 that ownership and agency, so that that information, that data can be protected, whether it's through cryptography and other mechanisms that actually allow that to happen, but protected in such a way that you have control and say over how your information is used, where it resides, you know, whether it's on a blockchain of, of your choice, whether it's just part of the system, whether it's something that I keep in my, my garage underneath in a bunker, right? At the end of the day, it's my choice where I want to go. So that's the big shift of sovereignty. It's mine. And when you start getting communities together and states, nation states, and even just consider like guilds across all the world, right? They all have the same interest. You know, that's another version of, of a sovereign entity, right? You, you, you look at DAOs, digital, you know, you know di De decentralized autonomous organizations, that's a version of a sovereign group that manages themselves right, right. through tooling. So yeah. that's probably the best high level I could give you uh, without getting too much into anthropology, okay. but that's probably a simple way to think about it. It's good. good. Yeah, David, would you mind, just tell us a little bit about your world. I, as I mentioned, I think my perception of identity was very one-dimensional and it's this multi-dimensional <laughs> space. How, if you were to give sort of an identity 101 based on your extensive background, how, how, how would you approach that for the audience? Well, it, it's always been a re evolution. I mean, we, when we, especially when it comes to the digital age, I mean, it used to be identity was still witness attested, right? If I wanted to give you a file, I'd put it on a disc and I walk it to you, hand it to you, you'd see me and go, okay, this data that, that, I was just handed is associated with Dave because it would be witness attested. You would, you saw me do it. Yeah. Um, that changed. Okay. As in over time, we started creating, you know, networks where you and I could communicate. They were usually closed loop, but they were still digital. And I might have a login, a username and a password. And that was my digital identity. And to be perfectly blunt, we, we haven't evolved much past that. Mm. Okay, when I go, we, we've added security features, such as two factor or multi factor authentication, you know, you log into a website, and you get that six digit code that gets sent to your phone. That's a form of identity attestation, attesting that that device is in your possession, or at least it's believed to be in your possession. And you can prove it by reciting uh, a string of characters or numbers. Now we're at a point where digital identity is ubiquitous. We have are pieces of our digital identity everywhere. 
Mm. If you think about how many username and passwords you have for various websites, whether that be social media, bank accounts, you know, things you do for work like VPNs or, or applications, those are all identity as it relates to you. And usually it's, it's very weak identity. It's a user name, it's a password, maybe it's a, a two-factor authentication, but that is your digital identity. Well, we've had to evolve, especially now that we've been in lockdown, we're not going to bank branches. How do you open a bank account? Yeah. How do you do those things? Now, you know, they're trying to do it going back to witness attestation where it's like, okay, let's do a Zoom call and I can put eyes on you and you can send me a copy, a digital copy of your driver's license, but how archaic. So we are evolving. That's the first thing. The second thing is, and, and Saul really hit upon this, and I want to stress this, is ownership. Because when you talk about sovereignty, it's not about where you store your data. That's a technical issue. And to be perfectly blunt, nobody cares. What they care about is, is it easy to use? And can I get something done? I want to open a bank account. And the bank wants to know that it's me. Yeah. And ownership of that information, of my information is key. Because right now, the way people use the internet and the way things are done, they don't own their data. They don't own the images that they post to social media. They don't own any of the information that is used to sell the marketing, for example. That's not sovereign. That's actually owned by somebody else. Well, I'm me. That's my data. How do I manage that? How do I control that? And that's the shift that we're making in the industry today. Yeah. Sovereignty is the shift. Yeah, yeah. So Saul, from your perspective, wh why does this matter for humanity? Like, wh why is this conversation important? Great question. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. But one thing that I just caught, I caught and just sort of hit me in the head um, with what David was saying is, yeah. so that whole username and password problem, there's, you have hundreds of, this birthed a whole new industry that shouldn't exist, password management, yeah. right? Why should we have that as a, as a, an industry or as a tool? Because it's so bad, we had to invent a tool to fix it, right? So anyways, <laughs> it's, so true. That, it's, it's, it, it, there's no other purpose for it other than that, right? right. Um, but, but why is it so important, right? That self-sovereignty and what does it do from a data, you know, sovereignty, I, I, taking that ownership of, you know, it's me, it's my data. I want to figure out how I want to leverage it or how I will allow others to use it under certain conditions. What this does is it starts to set the stage for a lot of fundamental shifts to Web3 uh, ideals, right? Decentralization, mm -hmm. data in the hands of the owner or the, the visibility of the owner, using that identity and data to walk into a public, you know, uh, uh, library for example and i don't have to carry a library card anymore i carry this sort of you know information and identity about me that keeps me accountable to the municipality that i'm walking through right all the way to i want to cross a border and i don't want to have to go and carry my passport all the time because these things can get wet they can get stolen they can be lost all the time if I can establish who I am to a high degree of assurance at that border crossing, I now can become a digital citizen or a digital nomad. I don't have to have a mundane physical thing anymore. And that's why I think it's very important because the whole spectrum from you in your house doing something of, of your own with your own identity and data, all the way to taking those same tools and, and, and that you get from that and leveraging them in multinational situations, international travel and brokering and, and, and let's say bartering. I wanna barter an NFT, for example. Should I be using a username and password for, for any of that ecosystem? Heck no, right? You would wanna have something that's higher assurance, higher validity, but also higher security, right? You, you don't wanna have to have a password manager to trade something that could be worth millions of dollars. You know what I mean? So anyways, that's, to me, I just see it as a, it, 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 it shifts the balance 180% on its head, right? I mean, you're, you're going the other way, 180 degrees, sorry, yeah. on its head, because you're going the other way. The, the human is in control of their data and their identity, but they can still participate in the global economy, the global community. In fact, that really opens up a lot of new opportunities that people didn't have before. Yeah, if you think about right. parts of the country where they're un underbanked, for example, being able to have a digital twin 
your digital identity that you can present to say, I am me mm. and I can prove it. Yeah. Okay. Now you now you're not having to worry. The the bank has a higher level of assurance. They can get through any money money laundering rules. Okay. Yeah. And without having to lay eyes on that person, because you have a higher level of assurance, a higher level of fidelity, if you will, around the accuracy of that information as it relates to that identity, to that person. And if they own it and they're maintaining it, keeping it up to date, keeping it valid because it has value to them, that opens up a lot of new opportunities as well. So this recently got very personal for me and, and, and the business that I'm in because we, badge of honor, <laughs> we recently got deplatformed in, the, in their bank, a large US bank that we've been banking with uh, professionally for a, a long time. In fact, I've started with a bank in the nineties. It got acquired by, you know, as it's happened in the last 30 years. And so I've been with this large bank. I won't, I won't call them out by name, but it's one of the, one of the large banks in the U S and, um, about uh, a little over a month ago, we got a boatload of letters in the mail that said, you didn't do anything wrong but we're closing all your accounts. We can't tell you why. Uh, if you have any money left in the accounts, we'll send you a cashier's check. Uh, pleasure doing business with you, but we're no longer doing business with you. It's like, whoa, we just, <laughs> we just got, we just got deplatformed. Uh, turns out I, I did, a week later, I was listening to the Bankless podcast, popular Web3 podcast. Turns out we're not alone. This has actually been happening to a bunch of people we can't prove it, but we're pretty sure it's because we've been making a number of investments and working in the Web3 space, working in the crypto space. And we heard on, I heard on that podcast that there's some governing body that has told all these large banks, you can't let anybody working in Web3 uh, have bank accounts with you all. <laughs> so this, this made it very personal for me to... Uh, say, hey, DeFi is a thing, right? If this can, ha if this happens in America, imagine what it's like in other countries with with much much more, at least overtly corrupt, government government systems. So, it's fascinating now to think about what what is a what, obviously the podcast is called Bankless, but a lot of people in Web three are thinking about now. It's getting more personal for sovereignty of data ownership, sovereignty of identity, and then proving to the right people if I want a bank. Because that's not going anyway anytime soon, right? Like we have to play with fiat. We have to play, we have to pay taxes. Like I have a strong desire to be a law abiding citizen in the country that I love, right? <laughs> right? I want to be, I want to be patriotic. I want to play by the rules. I want to be a good citizen, but please help me do this because there is innovation happening. This conversation around identity and sovereignty is evolving. I know it's, it's a big machine. It's hard to keep up with regulation, et cetera, et cetera. But how was, what, what, where are we going? Like, how, how are the two of you, are you feeling optimistic? Are you feeling pessimistic? And why? Well, evolution is always painful. So <laughs> <laughs> I think you just experienced some of that. Yeah. I, I think that's fascinating. Um, look, technology is never perfect, but it definitely continues to move ahead. I remember when, when we first started learning about cryptocurrency, all the naysayers were like, that is never going to work. Well, it's here and it's not going to go away. Okay. Even when government and nation states try to make it go away, it's not. When, when, when I see government agencies basically coming and saying, you can't be working with the bank because of the technology you're working with, that's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. That technology is going to evolve. It's going to continue to grow. By, by being punitive, they're not making it better. They're just making it advance even faster because now you got a problem to solve, right? This, this technology is now blocking you from doing something. So how do you make it better so that it's no longer blocking you? And what are your alternatives? So that's a that's a fascinating story, but the, I always find it interesting that governments or or people will try to smack something down to end it, and it just makes it stronger. 
it's like it's like it's like you know yeah uh, ben kenobi saying you strike me down i'll come back man that's strong <laughs> <Excellent. right? laughs> so, well we had so, to get a star wars reference today, I, have to, yes. I, I have to <laughs> but that, but remember before we did online banking there was similar resistance but when there was a tipping point where it shifted everybody supported it everybody wanted it. Yep. why because it was a land grab i want my com- customers on here so i can di- i can bank with them at all hours right and that's more something importantly, not have to pay so much in salaries to, for people to, to have to come into a branch exactly. less brick and mortar all those things exactly and so now if you look at what this horizon's talking about right we're about ready to hit this other tipping point and shift it's actually a departure uh, even farther away from the need to mm-hmm. actually have a physical relationship with your bank, right? It's all digital. It's all, all on chain or connected to cryptocurrencies. Like until they adopt it, there will be resistance by the old guard, right? And I hate to put it that way, but that's quite often what happens. And, you know, I imagine five years down the road, we're way past this conversation because you know what? I'm seeing, you guys are all seeing it. Go look it up. Central bank digital currencies are a thing. Yep. So the central banks of all the world's nations are figuring out how to use it between themselves, right? To create trillions and quadrillions of, work, of just data. And that that's really means currency flowing across all these, right? So it can shift. Efficient. It's so much more efficient what they're doing using CBDCs. I mean, it, it just is, it, it's so much better. There's, less, there's going to be less fraud. There's going to be a lot of things. Uh, funny enough, back to the topic it all comes back to identity to be able to control that Hmm. and having an accurate identity as a representation for your access to those things yeah because so see so that's central bank digital Digital currency currency. bbdc Mm -hmm. how Mm -hmm. just educate the, the 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 listener here how is that different than just having my money in, in my traditional bank account, that's all digital anyway, right? What's the difference between that number on my e- online statement and some other f- infrastructure? Like help us understand the difference there. Well, if you look at central banks and how they used to do exchange of currencies from nation to nation, they used to put people on planes with folders, and they landed and they went through a ceremony at bank two, from bank one, and that's how they settled what happened the day before. Mm. Then we got this thing called communications. We got digital communication or analog even. Like you could imagine like the the first T1s and those dial-up days, they were creating a way to go and settle, right? Because it's a settling between nation one and nation two, because all the banking is in broken and all that stuff happened. You got to settle it, right? So when we started getting into digital communications, right, and you started seeing different types of wiring, right, you could wire things. So there needed to be an actual wire. In the past, it used to be telegraph, right? And now it's like, you know, actual digital payload was going over a, a network of some kind. The same information shifting has always been there. It's how you say this is worth that and that is worth this and this is what happened here. It's always been there. We just get more efficient with it. Mm. Right. And that and that's created whole other markets. Right. You, you now have mm-hmm. futures and speculations and all these things you can do like, OK, what's going to happen tomorrow before it actually settles. Right. So it's always been the same thing. Just the current just the, the medium we're using has been evolving over and over again. And I think the thing to think about because this is central banks. There's only about 200 of them. Right. Because that's that many countries. Um, that's what happens. there. That's definitely different than your you know, merchant bank or, bank or your private bank or whatever bank you have in a nation or in a region, um, but they work through them, if that makes sense. And the fact that they're adopting it because of security, because of, you know, sovereignty for that nation, because it actually encourages investment, right? Uh, there's lots of ways to incentivize this shift, but the people that are at the, you know, the banks underneath or, or even the multinational banks, they're risk adverse. And when they see something new, <laughs> they push back first. So it's, well, it's and sad. You, when you, and you actually see that evolution as well when, it, when, when these nations started creating these CBDCs, because the first thing they did was they tied it to whatever their state fiat currency was. Right. So if you had a if you had digital currency, it had to match to physical currency. That was yeah. how it initially started. Well, now we're seeing, again, evolution, shift, change. 
So, you know, we're, it, it is going to continue to evolve, but there are some key differences there and will continue to be some key differences there between, say, a CBDC and a Bitcoin or an Ethereum, which is really on the on the consumer side or the well, retail side. How is it any different than just, the, say, and, and I am not an economist or a treasury finance person whatsoever, so apologies if this is a uh, ignorant question, but what's the difference if I'm a central bank and I just decide to, quote unquote, print money, right? Just, just print money and go and buy corporate bonds, right? I'm just going to go buy a bunch of corporate bonds with this fake money that I just invented, uh, that I just printed. How is that different than what the, a, a, a CBDC? How is that different than just inventing this digital currency and then going and doing something with it? Or is it, or is it not? Like, help me understand the difference there. It's more the medium, right? I think the way you think yeah. about it is they print in country the value of that token right that that stable token so imagine i'm in country one i got a billion dollars i want to deploy it in country two i could put it through the normal channels and lose about 20 percent because of intermediaries you know cuts through on you know imports and and, and tariffs and such like uh, you lose 20 percent off the top in most cases it might be mm -hmm. a little aggressive but generally think you're going to lose something a CBDC allows you to say, I got a billion dollars worth of US, I want a billion dollars worth of yen, right? And you're done, right? It's prints it in that country. Okay. So instead of a corporate coin. bond certificate, it's some, it's it's not on a blockchain somewhere. It's still on your your self your 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 your, your country, screen. your nation state sovereign data center, right? Yep. It's it's and there's some kind of protocol maybe between nation two's data center. Yep. Right, and then they they have their own uh, ledgers. They have their own ledgers and their own they servers own ledgers, sitting yeah. somewhere, yeah. and yeah. then they agree how to swap. Yep, that's why that's why you want to think about it. It's like you're swapping. Okay. All right, that's that's that's, that's helpful. So rather than physical paper bond certificates, <laughs> right, it's now ledgers sitting on servers that are controlled by these nation states. Right. right? Yep. Because the reason why I frame it that way is because we now also have ledgers on Ethereum, Solana, Avalanche, Near, Polkadot, Cosmos, et cetera, et cetera, that are outside of a sovereign nation's control. And it's de this, that's why this word decentralization in technology right. is, is so, such a buzzword. So it then comes back to trust. Who do you trust? Do you trust your sovereign nation? Do you trust the math and the consensus algorithm on this blockchain? But as we talked about last week, that's just one dimension of it, right? You, you, if, if the difference between connect to wallet on OpenSea and buy an NFT and show up to an airport and go through TSA, right? Go through security or open a Coinbase account, they have different level. Like you're, you're go on OpenSea and buy an F NFT. They don't necessarily care if you're the same person with 700 different wallets, right? All they care about is just somebody has a wallet and they're buying stuff. <laughs> uh, whereas the TSA does actually care that whatever you show up with to prove that you are you, right? And the, the KYC and AML, when you sign up for a centralized exchange or some more sophisticated bank, um, I know we've touched on this a little bit already in this conversation, but just to really drive the point home, what is the state of technology today for the TSAs of the world to really prove that you are you? And what, how do you feel about that? <laughs> Does it need to change? <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a great question. It's having, having been actively involved in that for a number of years, yeah. it's been interesting to watch. Okay, so there's, there's a couple things here. First of all, centralized and centrally managed versus decentralized and distributed identity. Okay, up till now, Governments really re do require some sort of centralized data management. If you look at, uh, you know, I've, I've worked a lot with various agencies, government agencies, et cetera, as a Saul, they have identity databases. I mean, you, you can't watch a crime show on television when they're not talking about, oh, hey, we ran this through CODIS, we ran this through APIS. Right. Uh, okay, I, I've actually <laughs> consulted on some of those things, and I know some of the original founders of it. It's fascinating huge data centers of information okay all around law enforcement usually border control visitor management foreign visitors coming into the country um 
it revolves around biometrics, multi-biometric, face, fingerprint, iris, DNA. Okay, so those are those are centralized mm. and owned mm -hmm. versus decentralized and sovereign. Okay, now we're now we're starting to see the merge of these two things. If I go and I'm and I want to present to the TSA my identity, right now it's done as with what's called a breeder doc, a passport, a driver's license, a government issued ID that had to I had to be vetted to get that identity to get that card. That's a credential that I get to present to a TSA agent at you know before he'll let me to the other side of security. Well, now we're getting to the point where we, we can present a digital identity. And how do you verify it? Well, typically it's through something like a biometric where I could do my irises or my fingerprints or my face, verify my identity against the central database. Yes, that's David Harding. You can go through the line. Um, we are now moving to an area where we're gonna be using other forms of identity in the form of, you know, I may have my identity, my driver's license, for example, on my phone. Mm. Um, in fact, AMVA and Apple and this combination of bringing, you know, the consumer side and the government side together to say, hey, you now have a digital driver's license and you can present that as part of your identity. Um, how you get to a point where you have a higher fidelity identity to get through security versus logging into, say, your email is a process because there are different levels of assurance of that identity. In fact, they're called identity assurance levels and they're defined actually by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And an IAL level one is called self-attested. We've done this a million times. So I wanted to open an email account on my on Google or, or I wanna get a social media account or I can simply say, I'm David Harding. This is the email address I want maybe give some other basic information and they say, here you go, here's your service. That's an IAL level one, an identity assurance level one, self-attested. At IAL level two, you have to take, go through some extra steps. For example, you have to take a picture of your driver's license or your passport and take a picture of your face and it matches your face to the face on the, on the, on the document. It does OCR against that data, against that document, and pulls the basic information off. It runs a background check against that document is, is this valid? Is, it, it, is this a valid government issued identifier to the state or, or at the federal level? And if all those things check out, okay, that's an IAL level two. And there are certain other things that have to go along with that. An IAL level three, which is the highest level, which is usually required for things like PSA or, or, or government level service, that's witness attested. Now I've had to go through this many times. I know Saul has, and well, you probably have too, where you have to go somewhere, give your biometrics, somebody puts eyes on you, yeah. looks at the document and says, okay, yeah, that's Dave Hardy. This is his document. I've captured his biometrics, run a background check. And then you have the highest fidelity identity because then it's been, you know, it's been right. truly vetted. And there are, there are several other things that go with it, including encryption, hardware keys, all these other things that have to be, all these other criteria that have to be met. But that's how you get to an identity or your digital twin. I keep saying that, but your digital twin that you can present to get certain services, certain privileges, permissions, et cetera. Because these days, the, actually, as you're talking, I'm realizing it's just kind of obvious now that I say it out loud, but the actual physical driver's license or the actual physical passport is meaningless. <laughs> it's like those can be easily forged. What matters when you go through security is they run it through their little thing and they 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 bring up a database, right? And they bring up some, there's some data store where your little passport or ID, which could be forged, doesn't even matter. They just need something to pull up on their little screen so that they can look at you and say, yeah, okay, this is this person. So that makes it kind of obvious now, like, yeah, why do you even need a passport or a driver, a physical passport, a physical driver's license? Can't you just present whatever the heck's on your phone, a QR code or whatever they want uh, to, to, to give it a go? Now it comes down to the centralized databases sitting in governments, sitting in nation states, ver nation states versus a decentralized database of identity and what and and um, right verified credentials and DIDs decentralized IDs. 
right? Okay. You too can speak a lot. More. I want to ask about this, right? Because now I'm asking, okay, if I'm building applications for the future and I, let's say I don't necessarily want to play with nation state A, B, C, D, E, F, G, <laughs> and I want to play with a decentralized identity, like an identity bank sitting on a blockchain somewhere, um, I can potentially build different types of applications. Now, hopefully for good, right? This, mm -hmm. uh, this is part of the tricky is that some people want to do this for nefarious purposes, but there are plenty of reasons to do this to help humans flourish around the world because they may sit, be sitting in nation states that don't actually care about them, that are not setting up systems to help them flourish. So now, based on this, I guess I have two questions for the both of you. One, is this a good thing to build a decentralized database of identity? And then two, what types of applications would you work and build on that identity database versus a government identity bank, a government approved or internal government identity bank? Well, th th that's a very good question. Um, there, there are three schools, excuse me, there are going to be three schools of thought around self-sovereign identity versus centralized. You got your, pur your purists, your critics, your realists. Those are your three. Your purists will say something like, it has to go SSI, self-sovereign identity, period. We have to get rid of all central, you know, identity, period. Never going to happen. Yeah. You got, you got the critics who are going, this self-sovereign identity stuff is garbage. It's never going to work. Okay. You know, you, you got to have it centralized. Somebody's got to manage it. And then you got the realists who go, they're not mutually exclusive. Mm. Okay. Governments are always going to have centralized databases. Yeah. They just are. Yeah. yeah. I mean, done, I've worked with over 250 law enforcement agencies in the world with mm. tens and hundreds of millions of identities. Trust me when I tell you, government's just never blanketly going to go, hey, let's just decentralize the whole thing and let people <laughs> be responsible for their own stuff. Because crooks, yeah. they're going to be honest. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, you know, the, the realism is I can have this phone and the TSA, if I have a, if I have a vetted high fidelity identity, can issue me a verifiable credential to my phone the same way that, the, uh, that my DMV issues me a verifiable credential in the form of a driver's license. VCs, verifiable credentials, are not just digital. We've been dealing with verifiable credentials forever. If you've ever been pulled over on the side of the road by a policeman or woman, they take your verifiable credential and go verify it <laughs> right. in their car, right? right? It's like, okay, this is a real driver's license. That, that's the guy I'm looking at in the car. All right, it's been verified. A verifiable credential when it comes to SSI is very similar. It gets issued. I have it in my wallet. It's associated with a, a decentralized identifier, a DID, and I can present it both offline and online, and it has value in both cases, okay? So a government agency can issue me a verifiable credential. It can be part of my self-sovereign identity world and my ecosystem that I'm part of that I own and I control my data on. And it's really no different. So they, they, they're cohesive. They work together. You, you have to have some sort of central identity management to even be able to issue a verifiable credential in the first place. So the purists, they're always going to go, hey, look, we have to go entirely blockchain. And that's how people are going to trust that we have to be SSI. Then there's the other side has been around forever. Projects that both Saul and I've been working on, which is all centralized. This is the evolution of bringing them together and meeting in the middle. I, I agree with that. It is a hybrid right whatever you want to call it or it's like it's decentralized with wells that you have to go into that are specific to that jurisdiction that region whatever you know i think this was on a podcast a year ago with tony uh rakowski where we talked about extraterritoriality right? right when data mm -hmm. crosses borders right well on a blockchain what's it doing all day crossing all the borders right yeah. it's it's not it's borderless basically but that's a problem when you have regulations for data like gdpr and pci and pii you get so many regulations that yep. say that data has got to be treated different and it's got to be kept in this region this way that'll break that so that's where i think the hybrid is sort of a, a unique here like you could have the the the, the identity is out there. I think that's something that can be, you know, sort of borderless almost, right? We start thinking about passports. We already have that concept between nations. 
identity that goes through it, but the data, the actual citizen information stays in the country. The healthcare information stays in the in, in the healthcare system, right? It's it, it's that hybrid, I think, is going to be the way that will win because you can't go one fully one way and you can't just stay with centralized for the rest of our, our uh, civilization because we've already opened Pandora's box. We got to keep moving forward. It's not going to stop. <laughs> The centralization is really an interesting issue because you, you can talk about how it's used by the government, but then there's how it's used in the private sector. And in the private sector is where all the abuse is occurring. I mean, if you look at social media companies, I will argue that your largest social media company isn't a social media company. It's an identity management company that provides social media services. <laughs> right. yeah, okay. Because their business is not giving you the ability to post your likes and make comments. Okay, and post your pictures and, and share with your friends. They don't make money doing that. How they make money is selling your data and doing it in a way that's actually, in my opinion, abusive. They abuse your trust. If you read the, the terms of service of, of most social media companies, not only is it draconian, it's borderline evil. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's, it's, it's scary what they can do with your data. They will sell it to anyone for any reason who has an open checkbook. Okay, so when you talk about self-sovereign identity, it's, it's how do we bring that back? How do I control and, and potentially even monetize yeah. myself how that information yeah. is shared? There's a whole school of thought that says, look, if, the, if your data is going to get sold, which is going to get sold anyway, <laughs> how do I make some money doing how do I get it? a piece of, of that? that just stole it from me. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, yeah. because I mean, you know, a lot of these companies, whether they're scraping off social media or the social media companies themselves, they buy other data sources in bulk. And, and you may not even be a member on that social media platform. You may not have signed up for service or consented. They're still collecting data yeah. and using it. So there's a whole school of thought around self-sovereign identity of, okay, not only do I consent, and consent is a big piece of this, I want to have access to X. I'm willing to consent releasing that information or a minimal amount of information to get that service. And what is the value to me? Is it monetary? Is it, you know, something that I get to do? Is it some, is there's an experience that's unlocked? Those are all the things in, in self-sovereignty, uh, self-sovereign identity and the ownership of that information gives me the control to say, yes, I consent to that happening or no, I do not. And to Saul's point, and I'll, I'll, I'll end my tirade here on this, um, you look at the laws like CCPA, you look at BIPA in Illinois, and now uh, uh, BIPA biometrics uh, law, similar to the one that's going on in Illinois, has been introduced in, in California. You look at the privacy laws that have, have been created in 14 states you know, around this country. It's an answer to this, this abuse mm. of, of data. GDPR was an answer to this abuse of people's identity information. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very real problem that now they're trying to legislate, but to, but to Solomon's point, genie's out of the bottle. There's, there's, there's a lot of money being made selling identity. Yeah. There's a lot of be money being made collecting it. Now we're trying to, you know, at least wrangle some of it back, but with self-sovereign identity, we're putting the power back in the hands of the person who, who that's their data, that's their PII. They can own it, consent to how it's used, and even go so far as to say, no, I don't want you to have it anymore. Yeah. 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 It's the old saying, if you are not paying for the product, you, you are, the, are product. the product. <laughs> yep. Right. Exactly right. So, all right. So I have a bunch of these identity providers on my phone. And when I have signed up for centralized exchanges or, or, or done something, it seems like it's actually more sophisticated process than signing up for traditional banks, which in and of itself is interesting. Um, and the way that these work, you talked about the three levels, right? You talked about the number first level is username and password. Maybe there's some kind of two-factor authentication or whatever, or multi-factor authentication. That's sort of level one. Level two, you said uses some kind of biometric, some kind of take a picture of your face or something as, as a way as tying that in. And then level three is a, a human that is witnessing, is that is that roughly those three levels? Yeah, pretty much. Um, with level two, biometrics can be part of it, but you have to present something besides your word. <laughs> that yeah, you were yeah, you. Yeah. So it's usually, it's usually a picture of your passport, your driver's license. A lot of times you do have to take a picture of your face 
to match it to the picture that's on that document. That okay. You, like your driver's license to your passport. You know, how the biometrics are used after that really depends on the service itself and, and what they're doing um, and what later services they're providing. Are they using biometric authentication at a later date to say, okay, yeah, we're, we're attesting to that identity yet again um, so that it gets presented. And it, okay, so if I go and I, I present something, an identity from my phone, says, okay, that's a device. It's a known device. Is it really Dave? Let's take another picture of his face, match it. That happens quite frequently. Um, it, but, you know, when you talk about IAL levels, it really is about onboarding the identity, creating the digital identity. And, and part of that mm. really falls into which of these three categories does this identity fall? So the way that the level two works, and then Saul, I want to get your, your thoughts on all this. Uh, thanks for your patience on it. But the way that it basically works is I've done, I have two or three of them that have, they take a photo of my face and all my government IDs and stuff. But it's interesting how they do the face one because they have me do it from different angles, right? I have to like rotate my head up and down. I have to go left and right. They have these interesting concentric circles. My question here is, I guess it's always just one step ahead of hacking it, right? They're, they're trying to use your phone's camera to do something to replicate the IA level three, right? The, at, the, the, the human witness. They're trying to use your phone as a way to capture that bio data or, or from the image uh, to, to verify that it's you. Is that how legit, I guess I have, to, I have two questions again. I, I know I'm doing these multi-part questions, but two questions. Is that legit? Like how, what is your, your feelings about that? This like camera thing and using your phone for that level. And then two, why is this important? Like, why is it, what kind of applications, right? Cause a lot of the audience are entrepreneurs, right? The name of this con right. this podcast is ventures. Why is it important? Why is this conversation around identity specifically at this level important for venture building? You want to take that Solomon or you want me to start? I'm, I'm happy to. Um... I think I think the thing that uh, just so maybe I'll let you go into the details because you have those different levels of ex expertise there, but the experience shift, right? Today, we're used to doing centralized identity onboarding, authentication, and then leveraging that for authorization. So that's one thing. What's the experience in the human's persona? What's the experience in the governance or the holder of the data right in the centralized version and then shifting to decentralized and these still meeting these different levels of identity assurance right what's the experience change you know do, is there a big shift in steps you have to go through things you have to have in your possession and so forth if i understand it right and david correct me if i'm wrong here it feels like it's literally a one-for-one -one replacement you could probably take an ssi powered ladder to that level three, just almost the same steps and experience as you would with a centralized one. What are your thoughts absolutely. on Absolutely. No, it's absolutely. There, there's no reason why you couldn't. Um, you know, there, there is a process. There's a workflow that has to occur. There have to be those checks. If I'm going to take a picture of my driver's license and my passport and take a picture of my face, or if I actually have to go to a place where I, I'm background checked, um, you know, happened, you and I've done that a million times, you know, we're going to go into a government building on the East Coast and they go, okay, well, you got to go do your background check again. So you go to a specific location, they run your fingerprints and you're approved. And, you know, that there's no reason you couldn't go through that process and they issue you a verifiable credential that you can then use and present. And, and yeah, that's you. And it, it is either time boxed or it's, you know, it's like a driver's license. It has, it does have an expiry on it. But yeah, it is, it is a one for one. Um, back to your original question, Will, about biometrics and, and the, the different things you have to do, the little, uh, the, the gyrations you have to go through to <laughs> capture your face. Well, that, this, 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 there's a real interesting uh, evolution that has, has resulted because of that. I mean, if you look at how, when I first started in face recognition, this was, good Lord, 22 years ago. Um, it was really around law enforcement, mugshots. I mean, you know, up until about 2005, you know, if, if, if I wanted what was called the jacket of a criminal, 
because I'm in one police station and they were charged in another police station, they would send me a manila folder and their mugshot would be stapled to it along with their quote unquote rap sheet. As we went digital, there were, there were specifications put in place for a digital mugshot. And they were then, of course, NIST again defined them, but they were very strict. You had to have a specific face to frame ratio, distance between the eyes, 18% uh, gray background, three point lighting, all this stuff. Hmm. Well, you had someone taking the picture, so you could see they were a live person. You don't have that when you take a picture of your face. It's not like you walk into a police department, they put you up against the background, line up the camera right and say, okay, boom, yeah, Dave's standing in front of me and this is his picture. You know, so you don't have that, again, witnessed attestation. You don't have a witness putting eyes on you when that happens. And facial recognition, by the way, is really easy to spoof. I mean... Dead bone, stupid, simple. Yeah, just, I can hold up a high quality picture of you next to the phone like this, and it's going to pass, period. So what they've done is they've, there's been a whole school of thought on top of just face matching or voice matching or any of these other biometric matching technologies. They call it liveness. I think that's a misnomer. It's really anti-spoofing, but the industry calls it liveness. So when you hear the term liveness, what they're doing is they're trying to figure out if it's really you or if it's a video. Is it like, okay, I'll date myself. Is it live or is it Memorex, right? You know, so. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, right. You know, I, I have to do this. I have to, you know, do yeah, this and flash I, lights at me and, and all that sort of stuff. And it's well, saying, yeah, that's a real person there that we just captured their image of. Yeah, because the, the last five, six years now, I guess I've been investing in crypto for, for quite some time. But I remember even the earliest exchanges, uh, I ha when I signed up for it, I had to write a p on a piece of paper or something, today's date, and mm -hmm. then take a photo with my face. It was something like my face, <laughs> my ID, and today's date in one photo, right? That, it sounds like that was their way to try to get around. Am I just taking a photo of something? Because I mean, that's, that's, I mean, if you think about it, you could easily make somebody a passport and a driver's license and a photo of somebody. And I could try to sign up for a, a, a Coinbase account with just, yeah. with just oh, photos. I got to tell right? you, just in space alone, there is some really, really cool liveness technology and some companies who have spawned a whole industry around it. Um, around the world. So uh, I've used a lot of them. <laughs> and there's even certifications for them through a through a, a testing agency called iBeta. They have what are called uh, presentation attack detection or PAD, PAD levels that they will test against so that your product, if you're using facial recognition, for example, you could say I'm PAD level two. I passed uh, testing that says I can't be spoofed. You can't, you can't present a picture of me and be me. It has to be me when they take a picture of my face. Um, and, the, and the thing is, is it adds friction. Biometrics, I love biometrics. I have a whole patent portfolio of mine that's all in biometrics. And I will tell you, it's a blowtorch. It's a powerful tool. It's also difficult to use. <laughs> <laughs> you better know, you know, so what we're, what we're seeing is a lot of technologies that are trying to make it simple, lower the friction. If you look at the, what Apple did with face ID with infrared versus, you know, what, what we do with the standard, you know, image uh, through the camera, they used infrared and you could take your picture very quick. It's not even a picture. It's just, it's an infrared capture, captures your face, is able to match it very, very quickly and determine that it's you. But the fact is, is it's whoever's on this phone. And that that's where and that's that becomes a challenge. But you know, face ID, you're not going to spoof it. It 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 works off of you know a 3D map through infrared. Um, so you know, you put an image or a video up against it, it'll fail every time. So it's very very powerful stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because even as you're talking, I'm realizing kind of the answer to my question earlier around from a an entrepreneurial perspective from a venture building there's all these pay to x services out there mm -hmm. pay to play pay to move pay to do there's a bunch of them and um I'm, I'm really interested in the pay to play and the pay to move stuff but obviously oh oh there's also pay to learn right you can go through mm -hmm. a set of tutorials and things and get paid 
I know a bunch of the early pay to learn platforms were just rife with Sybil attacks, rife with just one person opening a zillion accounts and then getting a bunch of like defrauding it. So I guess from a venture building perspective, you do want the kind of 3D biometric something, you know, face tilting, yeah. hold up the, uh, the date to your photo or whatever. You do want that because you want to make sure the people that are earning on your platform and, or, you know, whether it's a bank or TSA, but I'm just even coming down to this pay to earn or pay to play. You want to make sure that th that's an individual human being and they don't, they're not making a thousand different identities for themselves. So yeah. I guess the question is then to wrap this up, because I know we got to land this plane. What is the best? Like we just, we just mentioned 3D mapping, hold up the, rotate your face, uh, put the date on the photo. What is the best right now for ev the every everyday developer that's building a company? What's available right now as the best way to do that high level of fidelity attestation so that you know that this, you only have this one person attached to this one identity on your platform? Well, uh, what day is it? <laughs> <laughs> kind of answers the question because it's evolving. Um, you know, the reality is, is, is onboarding is the longest part, the creating the digital identity at a, at a higher level of fidelity. That's the, that's the hardest part. And, and really, it doesn't have to be done right away. It can be done over time. A lot of times, you know, a uh, very good digital identity platform will let you in at a level one. But then if you want to access something that's a higher service that requires a higher level of fidelity, then you, you step it up. You go through that workflow process and only then to get to IAL level two. And that, in my opinion, really kind of follows the self-sovereign model as a whole, because the whole idea is minimalism, right? I'm only going to give you the minimum. I'm going to consent to share with you the minimum amount of information to do something. Um, so that that idea of minimalism is 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 true also in your onboarding or your the evolution and growth of your digital identity process. The, the, the final piece of that isn't just the onboarding, however, it's the continuous authentication of that identity, right? Because every once in a while you have to go and, and continue to prove that, yeah, what I just presented to you on this device is representative of me and not someone who took my device or did a SIM hijack or something of that nature. So every once in a while, you have to go back and authenticate that individual again. And there are multiple forms of authentication. And just like there are identity assurance levels, this also defined uh, authentication assurance levels one through three, which we, we will uh, not go into, but, the, but as, at, a, at a very high level, there are all sorts of ways to authenticate your identity and they will depend on the use case. I hate one-time passwords, especially through SMS. The FBI actually came out and wrote a memo to the to corporate America says, don't use it, it's not secure. And yet I would venture to guess last time you logged into your bank, what did you do? You got an SMS-based one-time password. I know I did. <clears throat> as bad as it is, still prevents an estimated 98% of account takeovers. 98%. So is that uh, is that the best? I, I want to get Solomon's odds. answer to it too. But from your perspective, David, and then I'll hand it to Solomon. What is your, if you were to just sum it up, what is the best form of that level two, right? Because it sounds like everybody's level trying two. to get as close to level three as possible in a decentralized way, or in a scalable yeah. way. What is the best level two closest to level three as possible out there? From biometric, your biometric, multi-biometric. It adds the most friction. Yeah, it adds the most friction, but it's also gives you the highest level of assurance. Is there a and way? The real, the real the real brain twister is where's that data? <laughs> where's well, that saying, biometric if, data? <laughs> if, I, if I'm building a a, a um, uh, pay to learn platform, mm -hmm. right? I want people to go through some learning thing, and then I'm going to pay them a little bit. What would I use right now today? to ensure that the identities are matched with a human on my platform? Uh, you could use face, you could use voice, you could use uh, one of my personal favorites that I implemented was palm print. It, it uses the front camera, you just hover your hand over, it's very Star Trek. Um, there are a number of things that I can so use. Those are, those, are, those are identity services that I could pay money for to use? Yeah. To verify that that's a human? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. 
Absolutely. And, but, and, and you can't just focus on one of them. Okay. Um, multiple biometrics are required because not all biometrics mean every use case. Yeah. If, you know, voice is great, but voice is also a little more tedious. And what if you're in a loud setting? As good as the voice algorithms are in filtering out noise, I've run into situations where there's just too much noise. Face, lighting. I was recently, uh, I recently found myself in a situation where I needed to do a face verification and I happened to be in New York City. I had to, and it was at night. I had to go find a street lamp. That's not acceptable. <laughs> you, have <to> be, <laughs> you have to be able to work yeah. with whatever situation they're in at that moment. So... You ask what the best is, is in the in the one and the answer to that question is the one that meets the security level in the environment you're in at that moment. Okay, Solomon, yeah. I'll, I'll 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 toss it to you. I'm let's say yeah. I'm building a, a pay to X platform. I want to make sure somebody doesn't create a million different accounts and Sybil attack it. What would you use, or how would you approach it principally? Two answers to that. One is you're trying to create a unique identifier, a unique one per human experience that captures everything you need to know. That's there's only one Solomon, there's only one Will, there's only one David, and neither one of us can duplicate ourselves. We can't create another experience or another account. That's the design you have to figure out. And the second part to my answer is do not create it yourself. Just like in crypto, don't invent your own crypto. Right. When we're talking like encryption, no, don't do that. <laughs> Let, leave that to the professionals and leverage their services as best you can. Right. So I think David's you know, point around there's lots of answers out there for the, the how do you approach it, the multiple different versions of biometrics and stepping up, like learn from experts and leverage their yeah. services. <clears throat> and if there's an open source option out there that makes it you know, equitable to everybody and makes it easy to acquire and build yourself or build on something, I'm very interested in that, but this is like anything in, 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 in data protection. Don't invent it yourself. Don't create a new algorithm because you think it'll be novel and nice. You'll right. get it wrong every time. Every uh, time. So, <laughs> no, and, and to your point, Solomon, if you look at biometrics alone, okay, because again, we, we, there are two different things here. There's the, the creation of the identity and the authentication of the identity. The authentication is, is what you use or what you do each and every time you present that identity and they're going to be different levels. I don't want to have to use biometrics to log into my email. That's overkill, way overkill. I do want to use it to control access to my investment accounts, to my crypto, to my bank. Okay. Because I don't want anybody messing with that. I wanted them to know it's me. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, uh, so authentication really depends on the use case and the security requirements. But to, and to Saul's point, this technology has evolved so dramatically. It got, it's gotten to the point where with face, we don't have to have a face to frame ratio and a distance between the eyes and, and all those sorts of things and the three point lighting and an 18% gray background. <clears throat> it's gotten significantly better. And now well, I'm seeing new technologies where they're using fully homomorphic encryption on biometric data, which is just groundbreaking, mm. highly secure. When you're looking at homomorphic encryption on data, it's never unencrypted to be used. Yeah. And to bring that to things like biometrics is fascinating. That didn't exist just a few years ago. So the technology really is evolving. So when I, when I made the, the snide comment about what day is it, quite literally, <laughs> it's changing dramatically yeah. and all the time. All right, final two questions for the two of you for part one. This has been a great introduction to these topics. Final two questions. Uh, what are you working on now related to what we just talked about? Like, what are you excited? What are you working on? Two, where can people follow up with you to continue, the, continue this conversation in between part one, part two here? Well, I'm, I'm working on some initiatives around safe, smart cities. And there are identity components to that. Um, that's not my entire focus. It's like with Saul, we're, we're leveraging a lot of what's out there. Um, but it's really around building safe, smart, sovereign cities. And, and data sovereignty is an absolute key part of that. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, for me, it's, it's similar. You know, safe, smart cities and, and the conditions for them to flourish in. That's the key, yes. here, right? You can have all these great ambitions. I've seen this through lots of different like top-down initiatives. Like we're gonna make a new city in the desert. Why? 
We have a city right over there that needs help. Go fix it, right? So creating the conditions for change is what I'm really passionate about. I mean, systemic change takes systemic thinking. And I I fundamentally believe SSI and and, and protecting the data that, that, that goes with it and that ownership and agency that comes with it. The whole spectrum of sovereignty is a very easy thing to have a conversation. Once you understand there's problems everywhere and it's going to take a community of communities to change that. And that's what I'm really passionate about right now is setting up the conditions for that, both technically, financially, and just leadership. You know, it's an important thing to do. Cool. Spoiler right. alert, Solomon and I are getting to do a lot of that stuff together. So it's a lot love of fun. It. Love it. All right. Well, Facebook, Twitter, <laughs> Facebook, listen to me. <laughs> Twitter, <laughs> Twitter, email. Uh, you can uh, what's the best you, way to get a hold of the two of you if they want to continue the conversation? You can find me on LinkedIn, Solomon Gates. I think I'm the only one. Okay. So yeah. I'm right there. Um, LinkedIn is the best. Uh, okay. My uh, my my tag is Dave H zero zero three. So D A V E H zero zero three. I'll put the links in the show notes, gentlemen. This has been uh, extremely informative, insightful, uh, helpful for me as a venture builder investor. Helpful, I'm sure for the for the audience as well. So thank you for your time. Awesome. Thank you. Take care. All right, a couple quick things before you go. Number one, I have a general newsletter where I write about technology and startups and health science and teaching people to code. And I write about a variety of different subjects that we talk about on this show. So if you go to wclittle.com, there you'll be able to subscribe and you'll also be able to subscribe to particular topics. If you're just interested in one or a few of them, you'll be notified right when I publish new content in those areas. Number two, my partners and I at Proto Ventures have a portfolio company called Startup Rocket. If you go to startuprocket.com, there you'll be able to receive coaching guides and customize an operations framework for you and your team and your advisors to be on the same page in terms of what is the appropriate next step for you and your entrepreneurial journey. And finally, if you wouldn't mind leaving a review anywhere that you have listened to this podcast or watched this podcast, it would be super helpful to help those who might be interested in consuming this content as well. Thank you.